Hi, I'm Bill Olson, and welcome to the last episode this year of Free Speech Zone. We're going to uh, broadcast this show again next week. We're recording it live on the 20th, but we'll be showing it on the 27th. So either way, this is the last show of the year. And uh, I just wanted to, you know, take my clues from what's going on in the Middle East right now. And I wanted to say, Merry Christmas or we'll kill you. Or Happy Hanukkah or we'll kill you. And I'm not sure what the Muslim equivalent is. Or we'll kill you. Uh, I kind of looked around, but I, I did very poor research on that. But the point is, we'll kill you if you don't agree with whatever our brand of religion is. And isn't that typical of where we heard that story before? Well, it's Christmas time, and I just wanted to say that uh, I want to thank my friend at DARPA, uh, the insider, a friend of mine at DARPA, who sent me right here in this box a prototype of one of the projects that they're working on. And I thought it was really wonderful that th these guys, I mean, I, I was kind of s surprised that they would be building something like this, but, you know, it's real nice. I'm really glad that they, get, they wanted to send me a shawl. And, you know, I didn't understand what was so important about it or anything. It's just an ordinary shawl, or so I thought, anyway. But uh, then I got the instructions. And they the guy told me, he says, go ahead and open up the instructions. It'll make a big difference. So that's what I'm going to do right now. And... Let's see. Oh, I see. It's battery operated, but the batteries only have about a seven minute battery life. And what's this? A remote control. Huh. It says just just point and shoot, huh? Wow. There's nothing in the box. Oh there it is. Now it's gone again. Look well here, I'll show you. It's gone. But I know it's here. Yeah, there it is. Look at that. Wow. This is really working. It's amazing. Watch. I'll put it around me again. Hey, look at that. Now I'm really a talking head. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and play a cut from Alex Jones, and I'll be back with this incredible, wonderful thing from DARPA. Now, shifting gears before I get into all that, I want to hear today from all of the mainline conservatives. You know, you're the Boehner supporters. You're the Mitch McConnell supporters. You, you're kind of glad the borders are open. You're kind of glad uh, that the Republicans helped write Obamacare and now won't repeal it. You, know, you feel like you're part of the establishment for just agreeing with whatever they say. You also call into talk radio because I hear you. And you say, you know, I don't like these so-called libertarians, people that don't want to torture Ron Paul criticizing or Rand Paul. We need to roll up our sleeves and get dirty with these Al-Qaeda people that attacked us and teach them. I want to hear from you why I'm wrong saying that I think torture is bad. Here's the deal. It wasn't bad when North Korea tortured our soldiers. It was, uh, well, of course it was bad. Well, it wasn't bad when the North Vietnamese tortured our soldiers. Of course it was. So we're going to walk through why I think and know torture is bad. And then we're going to give you a chance, only, only people that disagree with me in the first round of calls to call in. Introducing Secret 12, the new InfoWars Life vitamin B12 formulation. Most forms of vitamin B12 are high. idea because if they can sell that they can sell anything the state owning your children euthanizing babies after they're born all of this is being pushed uh, nsa warrantless spying disappearing political dissonance you notice it's all bipartisanly being pushed from the top because worldwide the world is sliding into totalitarian despotism but if you disagree with me and you think there's reasons to torture anybody I'd like to hear from you. I know Jack Bauer made it sexy on fictional shows like 24, but 
there's a history here. We're going to talk about it. The toll-free number to join us is 877-789-ALEX, 877-789-2539. That's a different number on the Sunday show. We produce everything announced on Sunday. It's a different number during the weekday. So call the Sunday number, and we'll go to Derek and Mark and Richard and others that are patiently holding. And I hope these are serious calls, because I, I hear these calls on talk radio. I've gotten in debates with people on the street who said, how dare you not want to torture the people that carried out 9-11? Judge, jury, then the sentence. You get rid of that in Western law, we're now before 2015. In the year 2015, we're going back. We're about to be 2015. We're going back to 1215. Wow, it just hit me. 12-15 is exactly how many years ago? The Battle of Running Me, the Magna Carta, where they began to try to restrict and outlaw torture. This is the, 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 the zenith or the birthplace of Western law and culture that built so much security. Hadn't been perfect. Our legal system's not perfect. But let me tell you, it's a lot better than other countries. And it creates stability and it creates an environment for investment and a level playing field. At least more level. We know North Korea is bad because they torture. We know North Vietnam was bad because they torture. We know the Nazis were bad and Joseph Mengele because they tortured. We know Fidel Castro is bad because they tortured. We know the Romans were bad because they tortured. We know that barbarous cultures torture. And A, you don't get good intelligence from it, studies show. B, what you do get is fake confessions, fear, and terror. We're going to burn you at the stake, you know, uh, and we're going to prove you're a witch one way or the other. We're going to torture you until you confess, or if you don't confess, it shows the devil was in you and gave you the power to not admit you were a witch. This is the type of stuff that kept the Dark Ages going for hundreds and hundreds of years until people started saying no in places like England in 1215. The Magna Carta, folks, it's what our whole Bill of Rights, Constitution, all of it comes out of it. The Renaissance, basically it all comes out of it. It all comes out of that and some things that happened in Italy. So we are here now seeing hundreds of years, 800 plus years of progress being flushed down the toilet in a matter of years <sighs> under the pretext of fighting Al-Qaeda who our own government helped create and protect. Now they call themselves ISIS. And I saw Al-Qaeda and IS were in the news last week complaining, you know, how dare you torture people, you know, giving them moral high ground. You're a bunch of infidel scum when they are total torturers. So the argument is, well, we'll do what they do. Oh, great, we'll, we'll sink to their level. And again, I'm going to explain to you what they admit has gone on, not in this report, but the Army report of 2007, the Pentagon report of 2009. We've read them on air. I mean, I can't even say what's in some of these reports. The Army report, General Tagumbo's report of 2007, said that they would routinely rape people's small children in front of them, but also do it with flashlights dripping with acid. I mean, I'd never thought of something like that. that that's like Jeffrey Dahmer. And they would hire former federal jail guards and pay them up to $120,000 a year as Pentagon contractors who had rape convictions and child porn convictions. This is in the Army report. The Army actually came out and said, this is evil. I'm not lionizing the Army. The Army had to do the torturing, or they had to deliver the little kids. There was such a rebellion in the Army that they put out the report admitting it all. The original torture report that got almost no coverage. So this new one's a whitewash with Feinstein and others getting ready to leave office down the road, covering their butts. Total whitewash. The report 2009, much more hardcore as well. But you do not, quote, keep the country safe torturing people, ladies and gentlemen. Most of the people grabbed were conscripts who were sold for upwards of $25,000 a piece. That's mainstream news. Look it up. Oh, I got a terrorist. I'm the informant. And the informant's actually Taliban. And they would sell like a 16-year-old teenager who'd been conscripted to, you know, guard a pass to the waiting special forces helicopter and our own colonels and people. Famous, we've interviewed them. 
a bunch of them, not just Colonel Schaefer, but others, admitted that they would go, this person's not a terrorist, they're not even a combatant. They're a conscript. They would interrogate them for five minutes and try to say, we don't want them, dump them back. And up the chain, the CIA that runs Camp X-Ray and the camp within Guantanamo Bay, there's another secret camp, a torture laboratory. They said, oh, that's who we want. Because you know how they get child soldiers in Africa? Look it up, the formula. You get about a 10 or 12-year-old, you torture them a few years, beat them up, then tell them you've now graduated, you're elite, they'll do whatever they're told. They are torturing and, 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 and testing people to see who can psychologically be a double agent to lead uh, ISIS brigades and others against Syria and others and carry out attacks and be al-Qaeda leaders working for the criminal group above our government, they have laboratories, and that's why so many leaders of ISIS and al-Qaeda are graduates of Guantanamo Bay. People say, well, you should never have released them. Why, most of the commanders come out of torture bases. It's not working. Oh, it's working quite well. And when I tell you all this, it's San Francisco Chronicle, New York Times, New York Magazine, uh, The New Yorker. Miami Herald, it's in all the news. I mean, this stuff about rectal feeding, where they snake it all the way up 15 feet through your lower and your upper intestine, total torture, internal bleeding to feed you. When they can feed you down the throat. The Chinese communists tortured down the throat. I mean, this is just pervert stuff. The, the, the admissions in Congress in 2008 in a separate report on Camp X-Ray was they would put people on LSD and PCP and fly in hookers. And they would do satanic rituals to freak these young people out and then pour blood all over them and have sex with them. I mean, that's in the reports. You think rectal feeding's a big deal? Go look at the reports where they have, I mean, imagine you're a 16-year-old from Afghanistan and there is a porn star, because that's what most of these hookers are, with a devil outfit on and you're on drugs raping you. And you know why they do that at Camp X-Ray? Because they like it. It's for those army psychiatrists and CIA psychiatrists that are the real mingle of freaks. They're just having a party and want to fly in a bunch of hookers for themselves and go, hey, baby, go in there and do it. I mean, it's just a freak show. Why did Jeffrey Dahmer do stuff like this to people? Because he was a psychopathic demon. Just type into a search engine, Army Torture Report, and you'll get CNN, ABC News. Wikipedia is good because it has links to the Army's own website. Let's put it on screen right now. This is the report that has them raping children with acid. Now, uh, maybe somebody picked up at a checkpoint they think it's a terrorist. You torture a six-year-old with, with acid. Lieutenant General uh, Ricardo Sanchez, uh, the senior officer in Iraq, appointed General Antonio Tagumba to do the report. And it was a year-long investigation by the 800th Military Police Brigade. And it's the most accurate real report we've got. And it's got the rape of children. Okay. The media focused on guys, you know, with, with dog collars on in some of the photos. That's nothing. That's how they distracted you. I'm not signing on to raping children. Sorry, I'm, I'm a liberal. I'm being sarcastic. Uh, to give me a report with annexes, AR-15, 16 investigation, the 800th Military Police Brigade previously released, the Office of the Secretary of the Defense, and Joint Chiefs. We're on that website right now for TV viewers. This is real. I've read all three reports. I know what went on. It's come out mainstream news, the devil worship hooker parties they're having. See, if the Secret Service just called the hooker parties research, they wouldn't get in trouble. So the CIA just flies in the porn stars to get Mo. And then, yeah, well, when you're busy, when you're done doing the devil worship over there, we're going to do some devil worship over here. And that's pretty much, you know, the top brass in the military is full of good people, but it's also full of people that want to be killers. That's well known. There's a lot of Satanism in the higher ranks of the U.S. military. And that's what's going on. I mean, you want the rest of the story, folks. You're going to get it here with the reports. I, in fact, I could tell them right now, um, type in, prostitutes used in torture at Gitmo. And then you'll find the reports of that. I mean, just I, I, listen, when I say this stuff, it feels crazy, but I'm not the crazy one. I'm only reporting to you what's really going on. And when I first covered this six, seven years ago, when it came out, I got smart mouth emails going, sounds like a lot of fun. Well, maybe you're a degenerate and you're 50 years old. And that sounds fun to you. Imagine being a 16 year old goat herder from Afghanistan with Pig blood being thrown all over them with prostitutes raping you. 
I mean, I can't even say what they do on air. You think rectal feeding sounds scary? I mean, this is pervert stuff, folks. Imagine if George Washington, because by the way, armies have been torturing and doing bad stuff for a long time. We didn't torture. We didn't commit war crimes. It's one reason we won the Revolutionary War. And it's an empire that never been beaten. But the French, the Spanish, nobody could beat them. We beat them. And George Washington, you can read his biographies, read the histories. He would hang you if you tortured or raped. So you lose the moral high ground. You become corrupted. I want to play a Dick Cheney clip. We'll save the Carl Rove ones about rectal feeding. I mean, I can't believe I'm even talking about this on air. Total torture. Dick Cheney goes, oh, it's medical. The red Chinese folks, that's how they torture you. I mean, this is snaking something 20 feet through your body into the upper intestine. Do you have any idea how excruciating that is? And who are the perverts that want to do that? I mean, this is freak show level. I mean, if they were pulling fingernails out and knocking teeth out, it'd still be bad. But man, it's all perverted. Raping children? I mean, no. But see, they just tell you, we're just taking the gloves off, applying it's cops with some guy they caught raping a kid, you know, beating him for a confession. That's bad enough. But you can see the emotion in that. But no, it's children. Read the Army report. This is America. The globalists want to raise the hedge of protection that we have, our providence. They know that. And once God turns his back on us for the abortions and all the rest of the evils, it, we're done. This is the corruption of America. Let's go to Dick Cheney, the so-called conservative, who tried to pass total amnesty four times with Bush, who passed NAFTA, GATT, all this crap when he was in the early administration. This is a bad globalist, folks. But, oh, he acts real conservative, and Fox News says he is, so he's a great guy, along with Carl Rove. Let's go to the clip. You going to draw the line, Chuck? How well, are you going to know? You. I, I'm, is that I'm too saying, high? Is that you're okay with that margin for? I have no problem as long as we achieve our objective, and our objective is to get the guys who did 9/11, and it is to avoid <laughs> another attack against the United States. I was prepared, uh, and we did. We got the authorization from the president and authorization from the Justice Department to go forward to the program. It worked. It worked now for 13 years. Oh. We've avoided another mass casualty attack against the United States. We did capture bin Laden. I'd do it again in a minute. And now, Al-Qaeda on steroids, ISIS is just running all over the place, murdering hundreds of thousands, and our own government's behind it. On record. Look it up. We've done 50 shows on it, literally. I'm not getting back into it. Probably 70 shows. Our own military has gone public about it. And again, our military is the most awake because they've been there watching it. Joe Biggs works in our office. I mean, he was written about Esquire and Rolling Stone. He's a war hero. Did stuff like, you know, charge machine gun nest and run out of bullets and, you know, kill the uh, Taliban guy with his, you know, knife and bare hands. He, half the time, was out delivering people for torture. What made him mad was it wasn't the guys they kept trying to suicide bomb them. Because I've talked to family that's been there when they caught somebody dousing their kids with gasoline to call in the medevacs to uh, save the burning kids and then they suicide bomb or try to, what the special forces do to them. I mean, I get in the heat of the moment, you just burned your kids, we're going to kill you. That's an issue of passion and warfare in the heat of the moment, not premeditated. But Biggs would take them to the DEA and FBI in country and they'd Torture them to death in some cases. Finding out where'd you bring the drugs because they wanted to control that drug flow. They wanted to control that market. I'm going to go to break and come back with uh, Mark and uh, Joseph and Robert and John and Jim and Richard and uh, Raider and Derek and others. People who claim they disagree with me. They think torture is okay. But what about the other big issue? This will be used on us. I told you the Patriot Act, the NDAA would be used against us. It's all over the news that it's used across the board. They're ending the Bill of Rights and Constitution that protects us all. I've got a clip here. We'll play it after we go to calls. But I've got a clip here with the senator talking to uh, these folks about uh, torture and other issues. And they're saying, well, you know, this used to be illegal till now it's still illegal remember nixon said it's not illegal the things i do because i'm the president well that was proven wrong and then they got john Yu at the justice department a lawyer to say that burying people alive or torturing them or doing anything to them was okay 
I remember before 9-11, the guns and weapons of law enforcement or something like that was the magazine I bought in the 7-Eleven. Something said, just get it. And I bought that magazine, and they had an article I covered on air that said, anthrax is going to be released in a major city and affect thousands. You have the terrorist. He won't talk, but you have his 12-year-old son. Do you torture? The answer from former such and such expert is yes, you torture for the greater good. That's Machiavelli, folks. Once you say greater good, you're a Nazi. You're a Soviet. Once you say for the greater good, we can do bad things, you're now North Korea. By the way, I talked about how China and, and all these other countries affect our media and tell Hollywood what they can put out. Think about how controlled our media is by the U.S. government, much less others. New York Post, Sony CEO demanded the interview, the Seth Rogen film about uh, killing Kim Jong-un, tone down assassination scene to appease North Korea before North Korea reportedly even hacked him. Yeah, they even toned down Red Dawn, the remake, so it wouldn't criticize China. This is globalism, where communist China is now working with Facebook. They met with Zuckerberg last week on how to censor the Internet. And he praised communism last week publicly. A guy worth billions of dollars from a pump and dump who calls his users dumb effers is now meeting with the White House and the communist censorship czar on how to bring socialism and communism here. That's not me saying that. That's, that's major headlines. See? It's not that I'm radical. I was aware of this game before it was public. See, now it's public. That's why the show's getting on all these new affiliates and growing. It's because people realize, whoa, this guy wasn't fear-mongering. He was warning us. Yes, 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 yes. I remember telling people they were torturing folks before they admitted it. Or the NSA was spying on you. Or they were coming for your guns. Because the people running the country are a bunch of offshore cutthroats. Everything we... Everything he said was right, and I'm still a floating head invisible. Oh, dog on it. The batteries must be dead. Oh well, I'll see what I can do. The charger doesn't appear to be here, so I'll see what I can do to get it recharged. But anyway, I played that Alex Jones clip because you know he deserves a come up, and he's been saying this stuff for a long time, and people have been using it against him, saying he's crazy. And of course, we have several government reports that back him up now, and. And he even began to tell us about some more incredible things. That It's just amazing that our government would do that. You know, when I was a kid, everything that you heard is something that Russia would do. You know, or communist Russia, communist China. Well, we, didn't, we weren't worried about communist China so much. We were worried about communist Russia. And I had an important part in the uh, civil defense back then, too. My job was to pull down the curtain, pull down the windshade, window shade, whenever there was a nuclear war. So that would protect the kids in the classroom while we all ducked under the desks, duck, duck and cover. Well, okay, we're going to move on here. Um, oh, before I move on, I just wanted to say that, you know, Alex Jones, uh, it... It's hard to take him seriously on a lot of things because he, you know, misuses words a lot of times, especially communist, socialist, liberal, conservative. But you can't blame him because the lexicon has been corrupted. The words mean whatever people want them to mean. I don't know if I'm a liberal anymore. I don't know if I'm a conservative. I, I still call myself, uh, what, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't even know what you call it anymore. Uh, the same thing as Jim Hightower. I should play some Jim Hightower clips. Maybe I'll do that just before we go out. But right now, uh, we're going to go on to um, a Seymour Hirsch interview on Russia Today. And uh, I don't know if I'm going to get a copyright violation for this or not, but you can't just show a, a, you know, a short clip and have it convey anything. So I'm going to play the whole thing here. Seymour Hirsch being interviewed. And uh, the theme is that the people we choose to uh, run democracies often go for war. Uh, he'll put it a little more succinctly. Here we go.
You're watching a special edition of Going Underground. I'm Afshan Ratansi, and coming up in the show... So Bashar would invite inspectors in, give them carte blanche to come into rebel territory, and then stage a gas attack. I mean, it, it didn't make the smell test. Government lies and corruption. Pulitzer Prize winner Seymour Hirsch exposes the truths state and corporate media won't touch. We speak exclusively to him at London's Logan Symposium against secrecy, surveillance and censorship. And is contemporary art the new voice of political conscience? They break the system. They change everything uh, of the world because they, they remind us how much is important, how, how is important to know the truth. So, my responsibility, like artist, is to, to tell what the, the world. Plus, why is the British press telling us an Al-Qaeda Christmas spectacular to blow up five passenger planes is almost inevitable? All this and more on today's Going Underground. The all-party parliamentary inquiry into hunger and food poverty publishes its report today. While some may laud the findings in today's report, perhaps they should reflect on one of its author's right-wing credentials. Frank Field, the Labour MP who became David Cameron's poverty czar, is a co-author. He's the Iraq war-supporting parliamentarian who in the past has appeared to blame poor parents for poor outcomes. There are clearly some parents who, if I'd had them as a parent, I literally wonder whether I'd ever survive childhood. Too much blame on parents instead of austerity policies to bail out bankers? Field supports compulsory conscription to instill order and patriotism. And this is what he said about Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Under her rule, no developed state except New Zealand suffered as brutal a widening of inequality. Trade unions were the enemy. One of her great struggles was to bring the trade unions within the law that this House decided would be the law, not the law which the trade unions thought that they would abide by. I've been perplexed by some of the coverage of Mrs Thatcher's stewardship in the paper in the last few days, saying that the, that the country was ungovernable. It was governable, all right, but it wasn't governable from here or the, um, the government that was elected um, by the people. Frank Field slamming worker power via the trade unions there. Who better to author a report widely praised in the mainstream on poverty? In the past few days, Cypriot sources have claimed Britain has been flying yet more bombing raids near Fallujah in Iraq. Tornado GR4 warplanes based in Akrotiri have been firing 30,000 pounds Paveway 4 bombs and 100,000 pounds brimstone missiles at impoverished areas west of Baghdad. Sai Hirsch, the Pulitzer Prize winner, exposed war crimes in Iraq when he published his stories about American torture in Abu Ghraib prison. His journalistic scoops famously include the expose of the killing of hundreds of unarmed Vietnamese civilians in the My Lai massacre. This was, of course, just one part of the American war in Vietnam, which cost an estimated 3 million Vietnamese lives. Most recently, he was forced to publish in the UK a story that cast doubt on David David Cameron's claims used to justify British bombing of Syria. Now, working on a new scoop about ISIS, we caught up with him at the Logan Symposium in London against secrecy, surveillance and censorship. We're at the Logan Symposium in London. With me is arguably one of the greatest journalists of the 20th century, Cy Hirsch. Cy Hirsch, let's begin with Britain being at war in Iraq again. You wrote previously about a uh, redirection of White House policy under Bush Cheney. Is the redirection now manifesting itself in the war against ISIS? What I wrote was this article that said sometime around 2006 and 2007, um, in the Bush administration, they decided that they were going to really make it clear to everybody that we were pro-Sunni. We were going to support the Sunnis. Um, uh, it was part of what they, you know, I guess you could call it, it was part of the, uh, the, the end of the game, the... the uh, the change in the policy in, in Iraq, we were going to start financing some of the radical Sunni jihadist mil militias, and we were going to work with Sunnis around you know, the Saudis in particular, the Jordanians, even the Israelis were in on this. We were going to work against the targets were um, uh, the Shia in, uh, uh, in Iran, uh, Hezbollah, Bashar Assad, 
they were the targets, and even uh, Hamas was a target, although the Sunni, that was, that was okay. They could, they, could, they could change the rules a little bit. And the game plan was we were going to finance uh, Sunni jihadists. So um, the, we're seeing an impact this. ISIS has come out of that, uh, emerged partly because of uh, the behavior of, of the uh, um, Iraqi government under Maliki, who was very hostile, um, um, a Shia who was very hostile to the Sunnis, and partly because of that, and partly because that's just what happened. What about the jokes back then that people in intelligence or politicians didn't even know the difference between Sunni oh, well, and Shia? I mean, it was on. just a joke. Well, no, it wasn't just a joke. I mean, ignorance is, ignorance is, you know, people who fight wars are not the cream of the crop. I mean, so generals, you know, de Tocqueville, the great French scholar spent time in America and he wrote a, a series of books about it, wonderful books. And in one of the books, he describes the problems with democracy. One of the big problems in democracy is in the rest of the world, the undemocratic world, uh, royal families become leaders of the military. That's just a, a, in England, for example, still now, you know, they, they, they have knights and they get night ships in it. But in a democracy like America, anybody can be a general. And so the way you get to be a general, he said, was you have to have wars and you have to kill a lot of people. And so therefore, there's something inherent contradiction in democracy, which is democracies are always going to be led by people who push for more war and more blood because that, that's one of the ways the average man can get up, uh, up in standing, uh, unlike in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in Western Europe where, where the royalty did it. So that was an interesting sight. So we have a problem. Generically, military, the generals often aren't, you know, they, they want to fight their wars, they want to make their wars. And so uh, the surge, for example, that we claim ended the war in I I Iraq simply was a decision we made after a, years of not doing it, of supporting those Sunni uh, jihadist groups, uh, many of them filled with former military people, former Ba'ath members of the Ba'ath Party in, in, uh, in Iraq, that. They couldn't work, they couldn't get any jobs. If you remember, we, we disbanded the army and cut off their salaries. So they went to work for, basically were, they went to work against the Americans with Al-Qaeda. We started paying them. They began to kill Al-Qaeda. Um, Maliki came in, the Shia. He did nothing to improve conditions of life for the Sunnis. In fact, it was, it's been a war there for five years that we don't want to talk about. And now we have ISIS that emerged out of it. So, and now who's going to be fighting ISIS? Well, it turns out it's going to be the Syrian army, which is probably emerged as one of the best armies right now in the Middle East, is battle-tested. Hezbollah told him, came and taught him a lot about how to fight. There's no question Hezbollah played a role in, um, uh, in telling the Syrian army that the way you fight is you go in boots on the ground. You kill and be killed. You don't, you don't do the standoff American bombing, you know, and then... Which is happening in Kobani. Now, and Hezbollah, of course, still a prescribed group, despite them, in effect, helping the American and British Well, we have an amazing situation now, which is Iran clearly is working in coordination with us on bombing, and clearly working with the Syrian Air Force on bombing. They're all bombing inside Iraq. Um, it's unspoken. Nobody wants to talk about Tehran, it. Tehran, Washington, and London have all denied that. Well, of course. Well, well duh. I mean, somebody denies something, that means it isn't true. You know, I mean, there's no question something's going on. I mean, it's right there, it's obvious. What Air forces do not, Air Force pilots do not go. You do not have a situation where the, recently there was a bombing in Raqqa, which is the capital, we think it's where the, where the ISIS headquarters is. And the American Air Force, our planes bombed. And then a few minutes later, literally within an hour, the Syrian Air Force came in and bombed again. Um, excuse me, Air Forces do not work without coordination. And that's the reason you're seeing this sort of surprising series of airplane raids that seem to be unconnected. But of course, come on, common sense would tell you. Air forces don't fly where there's other, other air forces. They have to clear and it has to be controlled. Now, in Britain, we had a parliamentary vote famously. The prime minister here wanted to do exactly what you were saying people shouldn't do, which is airstrikes on Damascus, presumably. Everyone in Britain very happy that your article uh, had to be published in Britain because in the land of the free, you couldn't. Which, Tell me a bit what about, are you about the, about the you chemical talking? weapons in Ghouta piece that cast doubt on the official narrative that oh, it was that clear Bashar, that President Assad launched a chemical attack north of, in the Damascus suburbs. It's far, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to put my, the, 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 my right arm on it. But it's very clear that the, the story that emerged that Bashar used sarin is very problematical. 
It just is. It's just a very clear story. Uh, first of all, common sense says he had just invited a UN uh, inspection team, which was inspecting previous instances of use of chemicals, including sarin, uh, in March and April. That's what they were there to do. And one of the findings they had that later became known as that was an incident in March clearly was not done by the Syrian government. Clearly it was done by El Nusra. That was a finding they had. They don't make it public. But everybody knows, that's understood that it was, I think, mar middle March, March 19th, there was an incident in which they were very clear that it came from the, uh, from the uh, uh, opposition. And, um, and so Bashar would invite inspectors in, give them carte blanche to come into rebel territory, and then stage a gas attack. I mean, it, it didn't make the smell test. So that was the first problem. The second problem is that um, we did get, as I wrote, uh, the Russians recovered some um, sarin samples, and they were shared with Britain. Britain has a very famous laboratory here, Port and Downs, which is the basic laboratory we rely on, we, that is America, for chemical and biological assessments. And their assessment was it had nothing to do with the sarin that, that exists in the, the Syrian arsenal. Coming up in part two of Going Underground. Since the end of the Cold War, any country, no matter how despotic, no matter how corrupt, if their leader said he would fight the Russians and be it was anti-Russian, we would give them arms and guns. Ukraine is under the spotlight in the second part of our exclusive interview with Seymour Hirsch. Plus, in a week that the police service of Northern Ireland admits daily terrorist attacks in the six counties, we review the British press's scoop about the IRA's obsession with Jameson whiskey. All this and more after a short break. In the second part of our exclusive interview with Cy Hirsch, he reveals more about the secret reasons for Western intervention in the Middle East and talks about the geopolitical power struggle behind NATO's backing of Western Ukraine. That means our own laboratory, Port and Down, was doing stuff, experiments on this stuff, when our politicians here in London were saying, uh, this is a red, red line well, that has been crossed. Um, all, all I can tell you is what I know. I, all, all I know is I did a study, and the study was relayed to the Americans. And our, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff went to the president and said, this is right at the, the middle when he was talking about bombing. And he said that um, um, uh, you don't have a case. It won't hold up. And the president then canceled the bombing and explained it by saying that, we, that the uh, Syrians had agreed to give up their chemical weapons. But that had been an agreement that uh, actually the, um, that was proffered a year earlier. In fact, the Russians were talking to us about it a year earlier, and we said at that time, I think the attitude was, why should we do anything that helps the Russians? We didn't do it. So the, the idea that we were, that the president's statement that the reason he didn't bomb was because Syria agreed to give up the arsenal is lunacy because, A, he was willing to do it a year earlier. I had written, me, I, I, in 2003, 2004, I remember spending time with Mustafa Talas, the defense minister for, for years of Syria. And I remember him telling me, I, I visited him at his home in Damascus, um, uh, chemical weapons, oh God, can't wait to get rid of them. It had been written many times. And not only that, Syria doesn't have sarin. Syria stores, sarin you can't store. It's very, it, it breaks down, it's hard to keep. You store the components separately, and the components by themselves are inert. You have to meld them. And we monitor with the Israelis everything, and there was no warning. There's a million reasons why that story doesn't work. But when you get a narrative in the Western press, it's hard to break it, because the narrative was, it came out of the White House and came out of England, that it was bad, it was the Syrians, and that's the narrative. So you know, it's very hard to change a narrative. The only person trying to revive it maybe is the Pope, who said <laughs> the, the chemical weapons were being sold to Syria recently. But now the new narrative is we must, and this happened in the past few days, David Cameron still reiterating the need to support moderate rebels. <laughs> Robert Fisk recently saying he was down there and he didn't see any. Are there Wait, any? <laughs> are you kidding? What's happened is, I think it's, uh, uh, I, look, I'm not going to pretend this is new information. Many of the secular, what they call the Free Syrian Army, FSA, have already cut deals with Bashar, uh, particularly around... Um, uh, Syria. There's still some troubles in Jobar in the south of Syria and East Ghouta. There's still ha holdouts, but many of the units around, around Damascus, Damascus is quiet because Bashar said you can keep your weapons 
Uh, you can have your own little fiefdom, but you have to pay allegiance to me. You have to recognize me. And they've cut that deal. They're cutting that deal. These are the true moderate groups. They've come in. There's nothing else for them. And so believe me, uh, the, this idea of a free fire zone is an Ergodon idea. And um, uh, Ergodon's the guy in a terrible spot right now because he's, he's the guy that can't break with ISIS. He's much ISIS. Is, there's clearly been... The, Although he was with President Putin recently, which was quite a, quite a meeting of, in terms of the, what's happening in Syria, the meeting in Istanbul. I, I wonder what was, you know, that would be wonderful to have a, a fly on the wall there. But, you know, you can, I, I've had serious Americans tell me that what we should have done yeah, in 1979, 1980 is stay the hell out of Afghanistan. <laughs> We'd been much better off. We decided we were going to fight the Cold War against uh, uh, the Russians. Um, um, in Afghanistan, and we use the Sunni fundamentalists, including bin Laden, to do so. And so we've replicated that because we, we're, we've funded many of the, many of the original militias in, in Iraq, the ISIS that became ISIS now, were funded by us too. And now we're hitting Russia on a, on a new front, in a sense, Ukraine. Uh, many people uh, in Britain, let alone in the United States, saying this is a red line, Congress just passing that new law against Russia. What's your take on it? Well, Jack Matlock was a former American ambassador to the Soviet Union and a very much a realist, a very, very competent guy. And he was ambassador many, a decade, more than a decade ago. And he was asked that question. What he said was, he said, asked about the Ukraine, he said, well, he said, uh, I think we, sh uh, there's no reason, I, I, I never believe we should get involved in family fights. And there we are. That's just, you know, it seems to me. And we have been. Oh, well, I, 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 do I know something specifically? What I know is that since the end of the Cold War, any country, no matter how despotic, no matter how corrupt, if their leader said he would fight the Russians and be, it was anti-Russian, we would give them arms and guns. So there's been an American pattern of, of supporting the, the opposition. So clearly, I, I'm not, I, I have no idea what, what justifies anything, but clearly the, the, the answer, there's one question is, how much aid did we give to the Western Ukrainians? And don't, don't forget, historically, uh, Western Ukraine fought, uh, some, something like two divisions fought in Stalingrad with, with, the, with the Nazis in, in World War II, and those, there's a lot of memories. And, um, uh, uh, I just think it's so much more complicated. And um, there's so much more history, and we tend, to over, we tend to overlook the history when we look at the issue. And my own, my own view is um, uh, that the key right now in the Middle East is Syria. That's, where, that's the biggest game going right now, is Syria. And if that goes the wrong way, we're in real trouble. If, if somehow, and I think, I think um, there are many in America that know this. And uh, what's going on now is really fascinating because it's right there in front of us, but we don't want to see it. Thank you. Okay, we're going to just jump on right on to the last part of this clip. This is uh, really good information, and we're done with Hirsch, but when we come back, we'll give you the latest update on the 9-11 situation. Christmas spectacular. Yes, the paper says that a terror strike on the UK is now almost inevitable and that the threat has been taken so seriously it came close to leading to an outright ban on all hand luggage. No one at the Express thought to ask if they didn't ban hand luggage on planes because the attack is inevitable, then we're all going to die. As for people who are dying, Viscount Rothermere is more interested in the plight of flags. Ferguson demonstrators set fire to American flag outside police department in another restless night of protests. Yes, the Daily Mail is worried about flags on fire. It will no doubt be the same when it comes to the New York demonstrations about the death of Eric Garner. Less prominent maybe will be Washington Post reprinted statistics that a black boy or man is killed by police or vigilantes every 28 hours in America. But then the male sister paper, Rothermere's Metro City newspaper, is more concerned with flags too. Moment US airstrike obliterates black ISIS jihadi flag flying on Syrian hilltop. A horrific photo of an explosion accompanies this headline in the Metro, and we can assume that obliteration of the ISIS flag is the salient fact here, not any civilian collateral damage. Unlike what the Irish Independent News and Media's Belfast Telegraph reports about alleged British torture. Ireland accuses UK of torture as new hooded men probe is sought. 
Somehow very few papers based in London wanted to cover this story about Ireland's intentions to reopen landmark human rights cases in Europe over UK torture. Well, it would ruin the narrative of papers like the Murdoch Sun, which blamed the troubles all on the IRA, wouldn't it? Though they have made time to mention the provost. Garda chasing 15,000 bottles stolen by IRA. Ah, the old drunken Irish stereotypes are more interesting than British torture. This year's Turner Prize has just been awarded to a work allegedly inspired by Marxism. Could it be a reflection of increasing political awareness and contemporary art? With me is Italian sculptor Davide Dormino. He's the artist behind a planned set of life-size bronze sculptures of whistleblowers Edward Snowden, Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning. Fundraising for his project, Anything to Say, is taking place right now on Kickstarter. Check their website for details. Welcome, Davide, to Going Underground. Thanks. Tell us about the project. I'm very happy to be here, for sure. This project starts from a very simple idea. It's something about courage and freedom. Uh, you know, art has the great power to help people to, to grow up, to evolve. And public art, uh, it's a great chance to, to tell to everyone. So I decided to, to do this project uh, and to choose these three figures because <laughs> uh, they are, for me, they are three uh, contemporary revolutionary. They're being threatened by the United States and the British government, one yeah. of them of course yeah. being yeah. trapped in an embassy in Britain. They break the system, they change everything uh, of the world, because they they remind us how much is important, how, how is important to know the truth. So my responsibility, like artist, it's to to tell what the, the world around me. Uh, for do that, I, I choose the, uh, the the chair like symbol. Uh, because you know the chair is something that is very comfortable. <laughs> And when we are comfortable, we know we don't evolve. You know, we don't we don't grow up. So we can use also the chairs for stay more high, for change our point of view. They choose the the the, the chair of courage. And in the sculptures, there's one empty chair that's it for each of us, uh, and gave us the, the the opportunity to to stay close to there and to change our point of view. Of course, public art yeah. in recent years, it's in corporations' headquarters. Big banks have public art sculptures uh, outside <laughs> them. Maybe the CIA had MI6, GCHQ, they have sculptures. Yeah. But, you know... Um, the role of public art changed it, it, recently. Absolutely. I think that this artwork is for, for, for everyone. And every one of us have to support this project. Uh, the idea is that this sculpture could travel from country to country in the main square of the most important cities of, of the world, this idea. It's like a symbol, it's a sign that I would like to live uh, for, for old people, for create uh, um, discussion. Because it's important, the, artist, uh, the role of art is important when uh, uh, give us the possibility to, to make a question about our life. I mean, we've heard American politicians threaten some with assassination. Uh, Bradley Manning is in yeah. jail. Yeah, I know. A long I know. jail term. I know. I know. That, that, that's very, very sad because they've lost their freedom for, 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 for that. So I think that we, we have to, it, this is the only way that we have to stay close to them. You went to the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Yeah. I'm not sure whether you can tell us what uh, I, I, Julian I, Assange yeah, thought yeah, of the project. I, I met Julian Assange uh, the last week because I expressed my desire to the journalist Charles Glass. It is the one that with me are working about the, the project. The war reporter. Exactly. And, uh, and uh, we went there and it was uh, really strong for me because the place where he lived from 1900 days, it's very claustrophobic, you know, because you, you, you've been there. 
but the feeling that I had was to stay close to someone that changed the world. Something like an hero for me. You think uh, galleries would be frightened of exhibiting the sculpture if it gets created? He, I, I, I explained to him my project because he, he knows for sure, but he told me that the concept is very, it's very strong. And he told me also, I can help you, Davide, but I'm, 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 I'm close to you about, about this. So he didn't want to be too close to you too close. as the independent <laughs> yeah, artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For you. So you're using crowdfunding yeah, to create exactly, this? Yeah, exactly. Just because I told you How before. How does that work for a piece of art? Uh, we, we need 100,000... Um, Bids yeah, for, for exactly. it. Exactly. Uh, and all this money are for the for create the, 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 the fusion in bronze of the sculpture and for move the sculpture in, in, the, in the main square. And we have one, one more month for uh, arrive at, at the goal. Corporate yeah. media, they've forgotten about I don't know, them already. Some, some, some of Arguably. half word thinks that they are traitors. So uh, it's like a public execution if you see the sculptures, no? It doesn't mean in which way you want to stay. My idea is it, it's choose if you want to stay here or to this other side. But it's important to choose in life if we want to do something. Davide Domino, thank you. Thanks. Chose a different way to fight it. So. Welcome back, and uh, this is Marcella Pena. We're going to talk about some of the quick things, or quickly going to talk about some of the things about 9 11 that are, that's happened this year. And uh, we were just talking about the uh, initiative in New York, and I've already covered that on this show. Um, but basically, it went down to defeat over another technicality, which we thought you know, in the long run could have been overcome, but it would have put us in a position where we couldn't really proceed later. Some, I'm not sure of all the legal jargon, but basically that's gone, and we're going to try it again. And But uh, there's something else happening that's good, and uh, we'll yes. show you on the uh, screen. Uh, but just to mention that what uh, Bill was talking about in New York City, um, we're going after a technicality in terms of uh, how... Uh, building 7 was brought down, which is a third skyscraper in New York City that got brought down. So we're trying to go after uh, technicalities in terms of inconsistencies in the official report in terms of how Building 7 was told to the public, yeah, how it was brought down. should have brought that no, up. The uh, whole okay. thing was basically, um, if the building was bad enough from its construction techniques to fall like that, then we need to change the building standards in New York so that the rest of the buildings are safe. And otherwise, if it doesn't need to be changed, then why did it fall down? So they, they can't have it both ways. Yes. Um, uh, and Sorry. so that's <laughs> a technicality. That's how we're pursuing it in New York. That's the, the case. And we're using the attorney that helped the uh, the Martin Luther King family and actually successfully helped the Martin Luther King family. I want to note that. Um, uh, in Canada, we have, and they'll hopefully put it up on the screen, in, ca in Canada, we, we have some other landmark going on. We have a, long landmark, a, land a landmark petition was submitted to Parliament that could reach a Canadian, that could launch a Canadian 9-11 investigation. Uh, more specifically, a historic, mile, a historical milestone in the 9-11 truth movement has been achieved by a dedicated group of activists in Ottawa, Ontario, and, the, and with the presentation of a petition in the House of Commons requesting a parliamentary review of the omissions and inconsistencies in the official United States of America 9-11 Commission report. In the omissions and inconsistencies of that report, of that very famous report. That does not, and specifically that report, omits over 150 eyewitness testimony um, where people heard explosions. And all of that was omitted. So we're questioning stuff like that. Going on to read. Uh, this petition has been a three-year effort to try and get the Canadian Parliament to review it. Uh, a major milestone, major development finally unfolded on December 3rd, 2014, when a member of parliament rose in the House of Commons to present a petition from petitioners in Alberta, British Columbia, Ontario, and particularly in Ottawa, in the Ottawa area, calling on the government of Canada to conduct a parliamentary review into the events, into the events that occurred in the United States on September 11th. 
going on. Um, uh, the that went on on that day. Um, it is specifically we're specifically addressing the deficiencies in the official 9/11 investigation, including the fact that the testimony of over 150 eyewitnesses who had seen and heard explosions on 9/11 had been ignored. And um, oh man, and I know that I'm forgetting another thing that I wanted to mention. Um, I can't see how you read the tiny print anyway. Yet. She's looking at an iPod or a little... Um, it's it my note for. <laughs> um, but, well, sorry. I meant to be more organized no, in this moment. But just to at least present an update on two cases. One in the U.S., which was we mentioned earlier, which and we're, we're specifically going after how World Trade Center number seven went down, which is a third skyscraper that went down. And then this update on Canada, um, that we are, in a more general sense... Uh, going after the specifics in the um, uh, in the official in the official report in the official report that the United States government gave out. We can so. pick away and pick away, and I'm still waiting. Um, somebody in any one of the counties of the United States can bring a lawsuit, and I'm waiting for some brave person to do that. You know, uh, if you know, if this doesn't inspire some young law student to take up law with the specific purpose of bringing down the 9-11 conspiracy, I don't know what would. Uh, there are people like that throughout that's, history, and I'd like to cool. see it again. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, in talking about Canada, it is in cooperation in some ways with other, you know, I, I appreciate that he was talking about, you know, future generations. <laughs> in terms of the present generation, it is, I think, in cooperation with other countries um, in terms of them helping us review evidence, review testimony, review, review things in general that we can help supply. Um, I think it is in that kind of partnership and in that it's spirit that we can really achieve uh, more milestones and globally. The people the people in the other countries are up to speed on 9-11 a lot more than people in the United States. Here, we are very, very meticulously sheltered from that information. We don't have... I mean, you never hear anything about what's going on in New York with our petitions. I mean, in our regular news here in Portland. Yeah, you don't. So, anyway, we have about a minute left, and uh, as usual, this... <laughs> Live call-in show doesn't take any calls. Sorry about that. The, somebody brought that up once. Why do we call it a live show if we don't ever take a call? But, well, I mean, a, a call-in show. We do once, did. We, we'll, we're going to come back on the 3rd. That's January 3rd. And I promise you, we'll open up the phone and we will uh, listen to what you think we should do or pay attention to on the beginning of the new year. And did you have something to say? Uh, no. Sorry that I've been gone oh. for a while, so sorry about that. <laughs> I'll be giving another update when I'm next okay, year. Okay, well, it's it's a never-ending battle. Uh, all my life I've been struggling with this. Uh, you know, I'm, now I'm beginning to get a little pissed off that it's not going to be a wonderful utopia before I die, but, uh, you know, maybe in your grandchildren's lifetime, if we keep working at it. <laughs> so, um, see you on the 3rd. Happy holidays. Happy Christmas. Happy New Year's. Happy, happy holidays. Happy and happy well, everything. <laughs> yes, yes, that, yes. Happy holidays.